All right. Um, I will wait for some folks to get seated or into the stream. I know it's a tough transition between um, snacking and listening. Uh, snacking is preferable. Um, but without further ado, um, my name is Elena, as Christian said. I work as an iOS engineer at Calm, which is one of the top apps for mindfulness, meditation, and sleep out there in the App Store today. Though everyone in this room may be at different stages in their iOS development journeys, we all have at least one thing in common. When June hits, we tune into Apple's annual worldwide developer conference. Some excitement. Um, <laughs> And we lovingly dub this conference WWDC, or just dub dub. WWDC is chock full of anticipation, usually positive. So iOS folks have bestowed it with yet another pet name, developer Christmas, or Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, your birthday, or really any gift receiving event of your choice. And Tim Apple and Rockstar Craig give generously to us underlings. They shower us in swift language improvements, new features, new frameworks, new platforms, and increasingly specialized processing chips to power all of the above. But unbox these toys, play around with them a little, and you'll start to see the cracks. Sometimes, Apple releases new offerings before they've been fully built and documented. And unlike most gifts that you'd give someone that you like, these don't come with a return policy or satisfaction guarantee. I learned this the hard way about a year ago. When iOS 16 got rolled out to the masses, I jumped on a project to deprecate Calm's Siri kit intents and integrate the Calm app with the hot new App Intense framework. And as you can see on this slide, I've gotten a little carried away with Web 1.0 GIFs in making this presentation, so I hope you're as pleased as I am with them. But back to App Intense. Per Apple's docs, the App Intense framework offers a programmatic way to make your app's content and functionality available to system services like Siri and the Shortcuts app. Adopting App Intense early seemed like a favorable investment for Calm due to both business and technical reasons. Calm has a long history of attracting users who download the app in a time of need, some of whom will discontinue using it after just a few short days. My team wanted to explore ways to re-engage these users with mindfulness content and hypothesized that the App Intense framework would offer our users personalized entry points into the app. Better yet, these new entry points would work out of the box as soon as a new user downloaded the Calm app. Why not, we figured. We slated this exploratory project mere months after WWDC 2022 because we felt that Apple was pushing for third-party apps like Calm to serve up bite-sized modes of engagement, an impression that has only been furthered in my mind by the focus on widgets in WWDC 2023. Finally, integrating the Calm app with the App Intense framework gave the iOS engineers a chance to try out async await and main actor in components that were more or less isolated from the rest of the code base. Who could say no to such an ideal playground? So invest in App Intense we did, mere months after Apple gave developers access to this new framework. In retrospect, I wish we would have waited. Or if waiting hadn't been an option, I wish I would have prepared more before wading into this murky new framework. I found this image for free on Unsplash, which I highly recommend for your stock photo needs. 
and I believe it means road damage in German. I hope that's accurate, but it, it feels like the right vibe for this presentation. I'm presenting at SwiftConf today to try and make things easier for all of you. I'll share the struggles that I faced and overcame while integrating the Calm app with the App Intense framework. Along the way, I'll distill general points of guidance from my harrowing developer experience, advice that I hope will come in handy as you start to productionize cool new features from WWDC 2023. But before I share uh, these struggles and tips, let's familiarize ourselves with what app intents look like in code. Uh, by a show of hands, uh, if you have worked with app intents before, could you, could you raise your hand? So if I were to guess, I would say this is 10 to 20% of the audience. Obviously, I don't know because I'm guessing, but OK. I will show you all, many of you, something new. I hope that. With an awareness of the shape of an app intent, you'll be less caught up in the specifics of this framework when I talk through my struggles. This will free you up to focus on the more general points of advice that I'll offer. So here is a pared down example of an app intent that does one and only one thing. Play the daily calm. The daily calm is calm's most iconic daily meditation. I've highlighted the key players of this app intent in light blue. It seems to me that the contrast is favorable, so I think you are seeing light blue. And I'll explain them to you now. Custom intent migrated app intent is a long worded protocol that inherits from the basic app intent protocol and conveys to the system that this app intent has been migrated from a prior Siri kit intent. Intent class name is the unique identifier for this app intent, whereas title contains the string that a user can speak to Siri to invoke this app intent. The perform method is called whenever the user invokes this app intent, and it executes the body of the app intent. In this specific example, perform will play today's daily calm. In this example, I've generalized play daily calm app intent, the one that I showed on the last slide, to turn it into play daily program, an app intent that plays the latest guide from one of calm's daily meditation programs, which are the daily calm, the daily J, the daily trip, and the daily move. In order to achieve this flexibility, I've added a parameter to the app intent declaration that you saw on the last slide. The parameter property wrapper defines the parameter and sets up its string representation for use via Siri and the shortcuts app. Parameter summary provides a string interpolation that allows Siri and shortcuts to correctly interpret and execute a user's attempts to invoke this app intent. So what this might look like would be a user could ask Siri to execute this by saying, hey Siri, play the daily trip on Calm. I'll speak a bit more about parameters during my struggle section. And finally, my last example, uh, this Calm shortcuts provider it shows how an application can make its app intents appear by default in the Shortcuts app. To be more specific, App Shortcut describes how an individual app intent will appear to the user in the Shortcuts app. All right, now that I've shared a bit of the app intents code with you, let's hop on the struggle bus together. So the first struggle that I encountered um, when setting up the call map with the app intents framework was uh, the case of the disappearing intents. Though I was able to create a few proof of concept app intents without any issue, as soon as I attempted to flesh one out, 
the app intent completely disappeared from the shortcuts app. Not only did it disappear, but it took the rest of the Calm shortcuts, which I had not touched, with it. No matter how many times I quit and reopened the shortcuts app, all of the Calm shortcuts I have, had created were gone. I felt pretty betrayed in this moment. Like, where could those shortcuts have gone? To solve the mystery of the missing app intents, I flipped through, well, really clicked around, the usually unflappable Apple developer docs. If Apple writes the rules, then they must have the answers, right? What I hadn't accounted for was that Apple drops new frameworks well before it finishes documenting them. Developers gained access to the App Intense framework as soon as WWDC 2022 ended, and that was in June of 2022 for context. But four months later, when I was working on this project, the Apple developer documentation for App Intense was sparse at best. Nor were the Apple developer forums any use. Because the App Intense framework was so new, and the documentation was just completely missing, there were only questions and no answers. When the source of truth offers nothing but silence, where should you turn? Trial and error is definitely an option, but I had one more card to play. That card is twitter.com. I trawled through Twitter, searching for queries like app shortcuts error and various permutations of that until I found this veritable gift of a tweet. If I hadn't dredged up this tweet, it would have taken me much longer to find and investigate the app intent step in the build logs. For context, uh, the build logs are many, many lines, and um, the app intense errors are relegated to one small line, so it's a bit difficult to notice. I may be stating the obvious to all of the people attending a conference who care about this thing, but I still want to emphasize how helpful it can be to seek answers from the iOS community beyond that which is found on Apple-sanctioned forums. Searching through tweets or Slack messages is not so different from turning to one of your IRL coworkers to ask a quick question. Maybe you could come up with the answer yourself, but asking for advice will get you there faster and also with less strife. And for what it's worth, when I was in college, I had a professor tell me that if I was ever struggling with a coding issue, for more than an hour, I should go talk to someone or ask someone. So I try to embody that advice in my professional life as well. So these are the iOS communities that I turn to when I can't get answers from Apple. I bet some folks in the audience are even more plugged into the iOS world than I am. So I encourage you all to tweet out your iOS community recommendations using the SwiftConf hashtag. That way, we can grow these and even more communities, which will result in more questions, more perspectives, more answers, and ultimately, more learning. The only bullet point that I'd like to highlight on this slide is the last one. I highly recommend that you talk through your coding questions or struggles or anything with the attendees, speakers, and organizers of SwiftConf. To twist an English expression, conference talks are cheap, and the real gold lies in the hallway track conversations that you have here. And yeah, I do realize that I just dunked on myself, but it's true and it's cool. The second struggle that I experienced when working with the App Intense framework within the Calm code base was that of opaque method signatures. Remember the perform method from an earlier slide? 
Though it is the most important method in an app intent declaration because it actually executes the body of the app intent, it was kind of challenging to figure out its return value. I saw in Apple's documentation that the successful return type of perform should be a perform result, which inherits from the intent result protocol. When I attempted to figure out what exactly an intent result was, I struggled to grasp the explanation at the top and then felt further overwhelmed by all of the possible method signatures listed under type methods. There is certainly an answer on this slide, but it's not easy to dig up. Trying to make sense of the documentation for the parameter property wrapper was even worse for me. The convenience initializers looked indistinguishable from one another, from my perspective at least, and I struggled to make the connection between these initializers and the property wrapper declaration syntax. The code shown on this slide is totally valid, though it does not include all of the seemingly required method parameters that I showed on this slide. This was pretty puzzling to me. Fortunately, this struggle was quicker for me to overcome than the last one. I found that these convoluted method signatures were actually easier to break down in Xcode than in Apple's online developer docs. Though both Xcode and online documentation comes from Apple and thus should say the same thing, I did notice a few discrepancies. First and foremost, Xcode's right click and then jump to definition feature surfaces the default values of method properties much, much sooner. Remember my earlier slide with the web 1.0 help emojis? On that slide, I, sh I shared screenshots of the parameter convenience initializer method signatures from the online Apple developer docs, and they do not show any default values you have to dig deeper into the online docs in order to find them. On the other hand, it only took me one click on jump to definition to find this detailed, fully annotated method signature within Xcode. Xcode also offers more pointed navigation through Apple's veritable ocean of documentation. Remember the perform method from earlier and its mysterious return type? I confirmed that I had supplied a valid return type for an app intent that had a dialog by right-clicking on dialog instead of right-clicking on result. It is not possible to drill down into the arguments of result with Apple's online documentation. This sort of specificity only happens within Xcode at least for the app intense framework. The third struggle that I faced when using the app intense framework within the Calm code base was that of haunted string localization. And I believe that haunted is uh, a word that one of my coworkers used and it's stuck in my brain for this. The app intense framework required a new type for declaring localizable strings and this new type did not play nicely with the traditional NS localized string plus localizable dot strings file localization strategy. Meet my enemy, localized string resource. Even though I found it frustrating to work with this type, Apple had its reasons for requiring it for the app intense framework. Per the docs, Localized string resource is used to perform a late resolution of localized strings. This allows the Siri UI to potentially use different localization preferences than the app providing the intent. So why did this new type vex me so much? 
Before explaining exactly why this vexed me so much, I want to first share specifically how, Calm how the Calm app handles localization. First, an iOS engineer adds a new localized string to the Swift code base, as shown in the top left corner of this slide. A week before we planned to release a new version of the app, an automated script extracts all NS localized string keys and values from the Calm code base and uploads them to a third party service for localization. When this service completes localization, another automated script downloads their newest translations and overwrites the localizable strings files in the Calm code base. An example of a translated string from a French localizable strings file appears in the bottom right corner of this slide. With localizable strings files, the app is able to swap in the appropriate translation of a string based on its key, which in this case is strings.skip. Because it seemed unnecessarily complex to write new scripts for uploading and downloading localized string resources, I attempted to shoehorn NS localized strings into localized string resources. Treating localized string resource as a wrapper for NS localized strings would allow me to work within Calm's existing translation workflows. Though the compiler did not complain when I wrote the code shown on this slide, the text in the user experience stayed stubbornly in English no matter how many tr times and how many ways I tried to change the language. Worse yet, I couldn't even get NS localized strings to compile in App Shortcuts Provider due to all of the interpolated keywords, which are the program type and application name that you see on this slide. Just as a brief reminder, App Shortcuts Provider is the component that is responsible for automatically surfacing Calm's app intents in the Shortcuts app. How was I supposed to get localized string resource working without disrupting Calm's existing localization workflows? Once again, Apple's documentation offered me no comfort in this trying time, and the folks in the developer forums were just as confused as I was. A few more days of failed attempts and voracious Googling led me to this beautiful, beautiful blog post written by fellow iOS engineer Arnaud Joubet. Tears may actually have fallen from my eyes upon this fortuitous discovery. I was truly so thankful because this blog post answered not one, but all of my questions about app intense localization. It was extremely comprehensive. I encourage anyone interested in the app intense framework and localization to read this at a future time. But how could Arnaud, a non-Apple employee, have the answers when Apple seemed not to? In brief, he tweeted at a shortcuts engineer at Apple and got the critical localization details that, to this day, do not exist in the Apple developer docs. Why hadn't I thought to do something just like that? Arnaud's aplomb reminded me that Apple isn't a black box, even though it may try very, very hard to appear that way to outsiders. Plenty of Apple engineers dwell in iOS community spaces and might be willing to field a polite inquiry from you or me or anyone. And if you are fortunate enough to work on an app big enough that Apple hooks you up with a developer representative, that person would be more than happy to bring your questions to the right engineers. Arnaud's blog post also sparked within me 
the Aplomb to expand upon this tip with a request. If you do manage to get valuable, non-proprietary intel from Apple, please share it with your iOS communities. Your blog post or conference talk may have the power to quickly unblock someone else going through the exact same struggles as you. In some senses, I'm paying for the value that I received from Arnaud by presenting here today. And now I shall reveal to you the most existential, chaotic struggle that I encountered while working on this project, the project of migrating Calm from Siri Kit to App Intense for Intense. After having rewritten all of Calm's Siri Kit Intense as App Intense, I learned that App Intense were not meant to fully supersede Siri Kit Intense. Why had no one told me this at the start? It's kind of tragic. When I took tip number three to heart and started to ask Calm's Apple representative questions about my App Intense implementation, he told me that actually SiriKit is still the best tool for creating shortcuts and intents that play media. Awkwardly, nine out of 10 of Calm's App Intents play media. Siri Kit's IN Play Media intent, which you'll see right there, would have suited Calm's needs better than the App Intense framework, which is most appropriate for custom intents not already supported by Siri Kit. This is, um, I wish this were live footage of me, but this is about how deflated I felt when I realized that my team and I had embarked upon this whole project and completed it with invalid assumptions. If I could go back in time, I wish that I had, at the very, very beginning, compared the performance of one calm intent that I had implemented as an IN Play Media intent versus that same intent implemented as an app intent before deciding whether to migrate all of the calm intents to the app intents framework. My team and I got too caught up in the promise of app intents at WWDC 2022. We were especially susceptible to this rosy worldview because our old Siri kit intent implementation which did not use IN Play Media intent for whatever reason, had so many intractable bugs that we felt it best to raise and rebuild our intent implementation. I would counsel other teams to let data drive the decision to migrate or not to migrate a piece of software. I know that um, this might be stating the obvious because I think that we all in our hearts think that this is true, but it's not what happens, so it bears repeating. People make mistakes. And so, after a long afternoon journey, the struggle bus that we rode together has pulled into its home, the transit yard, where it will rest until one of you starts productionizing one of the new WWDC 2023 toys and then gives this same talk at SwiftConf next year, and so on and so on. I'm kidding, of course. Though my app intent woes have left me a bit cynical about WWDC's developer marketing, I will concede that at least two good things did come from Calm's early adoption. The new app intents do seem to drive habit formation within the Calm app. While only 8% of Calm's Siri Kit intent users invoked more than one intent per day, that usage percentage has spiked to 30% since I rebuilt our intents using the app intents framework. Another point is that Apple acted upon the feedback that I offered within a matter of weeks. Fixes for the App Intense framework bugs that I noticed were shipped in minor and patch versions between iOS 16.2 and 16.4. Furthermore, 
my collaboration with Apple seems to have won Calm some goodwill. This year, we unexpectedly received additional rushed App Store reviews and developer support opportunities, which I have interpreted as a reward. Oh, well, this bulleted list has three items. Should have said that earlier, but I will confess now that it has been a pleasure to turn my chaos into counsel today. Writing this talk several months after working on Calm's tortuous app intense integration, I feel more aware of the strategies that I can employ to puzzle through new and sparsely documented Apple developer features. I hope that by sharing my specific struggles and the more general learnings that I've synthesized from those struggles, you can skip the struggles altogether and actually enjoy playing around with the fun new toys that Apple gives us year after year. Like the fog, burning off at midday, my cynicism is clearing, which is beautiful, mostly. And I believe once again in our potential to build wildly successful products using Apple's new toys. Before I skip off into the sunset with my poetic language, I must say a hearty dankeschön to Chris and the rest of the Swift Comp team in the yellow shirts, and to my fellow speakers and attendees. You are all more than welcome to ask me anything now, or if you're looking for beer and not this, you can follow up with me at a later time. So thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Sorry if I missed, uh, you said that the shortcut was cleared, y your up shortcut was cleared from the shortcut list. What happened? Sorry oh, if I missed. Oh, yes. Maybe I might have explained it poorly, but let me go back many, many slides. Let's see where we're at. So, what happened? Whoop. I probably hit it with that. What I found out is that um, I had just like uh, misconstructed one of the many components or one of the many types in the used by the App Intense framework. I can't remember which one specifically. And for whatever reason, I wasn't getting a compile time error. I was just getting an error like buried deep within the build logs. And when uh, when Apple doesn't like what you're doing within the app intense framework, it's like, all right, you get zero intents now, zero shortcuts. Like, it's not like, oh, these were the successful app intents, they get to show up in the shortcuts app. It's all or nothing. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. Um, this, this tweet actually comes with some images and examples specific to the person who tweeted it, so that would also be a great place to look for some more specificity. I hope that is helpful. Uh, this, this was actually related to, I think that, let me see if I show this a little bit. Okay. So, so the type on this slide, play generic daily program type, I have not shown in this presentation how I constructed that type, but that type does indeed have uh, a string display representation that uses the new localized string resource. And I do think that you're right that my issue was related to my attempt to bridge between NS localized string and localized string resource. Since I'm here. <laughs> How did you how did you manage the problem of uh, uh, yes. well uh, iOS 16? Uh, um, you, you are limited to iOS 16, so th that was no problem for you. Or? Yes, I think that we made a business decision to just have uh, to be okay with these new intents only being available to 16 plus users. Um, and I know that other companies may support like you know more minimum versions than than that, but 
we were able to make that choice. Okay. And so, so you, yeah, it, on the end, it, it was a success story, right? So you, you ended up with um, working uh, app intents. Yes, but okay. they would have been more performant if they had been implemented with IN Play Media intent. Mm -hmm. So the, the ranking would be um, what, what we did previously, which was using some sort of IN intent class, but not the Play Media intent one. Mm -hmm. And then what I did, which was I, uh, use the app intents framework. And the truly like elite way to do this would be using IN Play Media intent. But after having done all this work and having other projects that we wanted to work on more, we were like, you know what? We're not going to make the switch right now. Like maybe someday if we're noticing performance issues with these intents, we would consider it. But app intents is a success, but it's a I don't know what the right word is right now. It's a it's a mild success, not like a thrilling success. <laughs> yeah. First of all, um, I I feel what you felt because we always have problems like that with other frameworks too. Um, fortunately, you are lucky that you have an, an app for keeping calm and you can use the rest of the, the app that works. So how long, how long did it take uh, until you realized that this is not the way and to go back to ZeriKit? That is a good question. I believe I was working on this project for, I want to say one and a half months, maybe one month. So it wasn't a huge project. Um, and for what it's worth, we never did go back to ZeriKit just because what we had built was working well enough, and the code is relatively simple to understand. So, mild success. <laughs> Sorry, I have a slightly unrelated question, but um, I think a lot of popular apps on the App Store, they get reached out by Apple before the conferences to play around with devices or new version of OSs before people get to see it. Have you ever been approached for any of those things? Calm definitely has, um, not in the case of this project. Um, I honestly am not sure if that's proprietary information, so I won't say more, other than it's not Vision OS or anything like that. So thank you, Elena. Please give her a big round of applause.